Okay, so this is uh, Revelation 20, uh, probably the most controversial six verses in the Bible. Uh, people fight about it. Uh, whole denominations are created around whether or not you understand this passage one way or the other. Um, uh, there are uh, hard feelings among different schools of thought on this. I mention all that to say that none of that is allowable here. We're not fighting over this. <laughs> you know, we're just not going to do it. Uh, I, I'm going to try to, uh, obviously, I've been teaching uh, Revelation on a particular path, and I'm going to stay on that path for this, for this uh, chapter as well, and so you'll get that view, but I'm going to try to fairly show you uh, the uh, two other views um, and why I, don't, I think that they fail um, ultimately in, in, in their exegesis. But it's not anything that's a test of orthodoxy. You understand? It's not a test of orthodoxy. Someone is not more or less Christian because they're a mill or pre mill or post mill. <laughs> they're just not. It's just, you know, we don't do that. Uh, and, and usually the charge among the people are, you know, if you're a mill or post mill or, or pre mill, the charge is always an ad hominem charge. And the charge is you, you're not a faithful reader of scripture instead of you just disagree over something. You know, I mean, don't take it to that level. Uh, the reason that this is a controversial passage is because it's difficult. It is. Uh, and so I, you know, I'm on mill. Everybody knows it. It's no big secret. Uh, but, you know, if, if you want to make the mistake of being pre mill, <laughs> by all means, entertain yourself with that. <laughs> I'm teasing. It's, it's literally, you know, I, I just want us to be patient with one another. Um, and I am just not going to make this a test of orthodoxy, but I am going to teach it in the way that I have been teaching it, uh, and you'll see why it makes sense within that context. All right, so does everybody have uh, a handout on the millennium? Uh, you know what a millennium is, what, right? Do you know what it stands for? It means a thousand years. It's, it's just Latin. So now you all know your first Latin word. <laughs> It's, uh, it just stands for a thousand. And the way uh, that I, I am understanding uh, the millennium, and we'll read down through this, but you'll see my, the, the major statement that I put at the top. The millennium is, an inaugur is inaugurated during the church age as God limits Satan's deceptive powers and as deceased Christians are vindicated by reigning in heaven. The millennium is concluded by a resurgence of Satan's deceptive assault against the church and the final judgment. So... As I read the book of Revelation, the millennium is the period of time between the cross and the second coming in the new heavens and the new earth. That is what um, uh, Revelation 20 is describing. That thousand years is a symbolic number uh, for that period of time. Uh, but I'm going to, as we go down through this, I'm going to make sure that I show you what the other two schools of thought are too, just to be fair. Uh, and so you'll be able to see what they are, because these are words that you hear thrown around and it probably helps to know it. But I'm not, I'm not going to be able to unpack these at great length, because you realize that even within these three schools of thought, premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennial, uh, there's a huge range of differences within each of the positions. And so once you do the permutations on all this, you almost have to ask each individual that you're chatting with, you almost have to ask them, okay, unpack that for me. What, you know, where are you on this and where are you on that? Because they'll often use words uh, that will make you think that they're in one particular school of thought. And then you find out they're using the word a little differently than you thought they were and you're not sure. So it, it really is a huge uh, amount of variables with, within all this, uh, but I'm going to show you how I've arrived at it. And again, you're free to disagree with that. You're free to question it. Uh, it is not a requirement for membership here that you be one or the other. That's not on the table. It's not even on the table. Okay. All right. Ready, set, go. Yes. All right. Now for the correct point of view. <laughs> 
You get to tease the other guy. That you get to do. <laughs> then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, verse 1, uh, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. So an abyss is just a big pit. And so this angel, the symbol is, is a big key. Uh, and he has a chain. And he laid hold of the dragon, uh, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And there's the, uh, this is the only section of scripture that this appears in. All right. So the question is, we've been reading up till now 19 chapters, and in 19 chapters, virtually everything that we have read has been a symbol. The lampstands are a symbol. Everything's a symbol. And this description of the dragon is right from chapter 12, verse 9. So we've already seen it before. This is not new material. And so remember, Satan is a spiritual being. Now, let me ask you a question. Is he a real dragon? Like Barney the purple dinosaur kind of thing? No, he's not a real dragon. Can a spiritual being be put into a physical chain? No. Uh, does an angel have a physical key to a physical chain to bind a dragon in a physical pit? No, obviously not. We, the, the language of Revelation has not been used in that way for 19 chapters. So now when we get to chapter 20, you don't suddenly change your reading strategy and start reading chapter 20 in an entirely different way than you've read the rest of it. But that's exactly what happens. People jump in here at chapter 20 without reference to chapters 1 through 19, and they begin to read chapter 20 in a completely different way than the remainder of Revelation is written. And that, that gets to be the point that I'll make. Uh, and he laid hold of the dragon, who was the serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, and he threw him into the abyss, into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him. Why? What is the reason for this? The reason is so that what? So that he would not deceive the nations any longer. Now, if this doesn't, if this describes only something that happens at the end of time, then what nations would be left to deceive? Aren't they gone? They'd be gone by now, wouldn't they? So, if Satan is in the position to deceive the nations, haven't we seen that that is his literal job description until he is finally defeated? That is what he's been doing entirely through the book of Revelation, is deceiving the nations. That's the whole point. And then the nations rise to do what? To annihilate the church. That's the whole point. But... Uh, what is being uh, seen here is that he is thrown into the abyss and the key and the chain, all symbolic of somehow uh, restricting Satan from his continued ability or uh, limits his ability to deceive. That's the whole point. So that he would not deceive the nations any longer until when? Until the thousand years were completed. So that completion stops the deception, the ongoing deception of the nations. Well, when does that happen? The second coming, right? So this thousand years is the symbolic number between, uh, and I'm going to show you where uh, Christ uh, uh, binds Satan, and you've seen this language before, but we've uh, read it uh, maybe too quickly or read it uh, too, uh, uh, too thinly. So until a thousand years were completed, and after these things, he must be released for a short time. So what's the point here? So we have a symbolic chain, we have a symbolic pit, we have a symbolic dragon. Uh, you can't put a spiritual being into a physical pit with a physical chain uh, and a physical key. But Jesus bound Satan in his life, death, and resurrection. Uh, look at uh, Luke 11, uh, 20. Uh, and uh, this, is in, uh, this idea appears in more than one gospel, but it's just a way for us to quickly see it. 
Jesus is talking about why he cast out demons. And remember when we were looking in Mark at when Jesus is doing exorcisms? The point of the exorcisms are what? To show that Christ has defeated evil. That's the point of the exorcisms. That's why the demons all say, you, you know, they don't talk back to Jesus because he completely defeats them. And this is what he says in uh, Luke eleven twenty. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom is here. It's not something in the future. It's not a future millennium. It's now. The kingdom of God has come. And the reason you know that is because I cast out demons and then uh, he goes on to tell, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and, distribute, uh, his plum, uh, and distributes his plunder. So his, his, the point of this story is this is what he has done to, to Satan. Uh, uh, turn to Colossians uh, 2.15. You'll see the same thing. Colossians 2.15. Uh, and you've seen this passage before. It said, When he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Uh, um, actually, if you start up in uh, uh, verse 14, having canceled out the certificate of, de uh, of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which is hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And that is when he had disarmed uh, rulers and authorities. Rulers and authorities are uh, evil satanic forces. So it's the cross that defeats uh, Satan. It's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, that defeats Satan. Uh, look at Hebrews 2.14. Hebrews 2, 14, Therefore, since the children uh, share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, in other words, uh, he became human, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So how, when is Satan rendered powerless? In the death of Jesus Christ. That's when he is defeated. He's defeated on the cross. And if you go through uh, all, you know, we could be here all night just going through the New Testament, all the epistles, and we kind of quickly read over these kind of passages of Scripture. But Satan was defeated and bound on the cross of Calvary. And he was bound uh, so that he was limited in his ability to destroy and deceive the church, uh, which is why Jesus said what? Uh, I have come to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the reason the gates of hell uh, will not prevail against it is because Satan has been bound for this period of time and is limited in his ability to destroy the church. And so that is uh, all reflected now in more uh, pictorial language in Revelation. It's uh, uh, it, it, kind of a big picture stuff that he threw uh, Satan to the abyss and he sealed him so that he would not deceive the uh, nations any longer until the thousand years are complete. So the, the thousand is just a, a symbolic number. You know, uh, Peter says a thousand years is a day, is a day is a thousand years. Uh, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, uh, right? Uh, remember Joshua uh, and, uh, was saying that uh, every Israeli army uh, uh, soldier would kill a thousand men. Well, that, you know, it's obviously a metaphor for, you know, the power of God uh, that was uh, in, in uh, Israel's military as it was conquering uh, uh, Canaan. Uh, so you see that the, the thousand is used fairly often. All right? Question? Go ahead. Regarding that scripture, it says it keeps them from deceiving the nations anymore until a thousand year reign, but nations are still being deceived. So, so the question. Yeah, so the question is um, aren't nations still being deceived? Um, and the answer is yes. What this is a picture of is exactly what we've seen in the rest of Revelation, where Satan has limited authority to uh, deceive uh, nations. And the nations are always what in Revelation? 
Un yes, unbelievers, 100%. So uh, the, the, the ability to deceive them to the point where they can destroy the church, which is what we've seen for, for, for 19 chapters. In other words, if we just jumped into this right here, we would lose the context of 19 chapters. But we've been told for 19 chapters that Satan has a limited ability and the Lord allows him to go just so far in uh, deceiving nations or in, in letting nations uh, uh, attack the church or the martyrs and the saints and things of that sort. So it's a, not a definitive statement that Satan has no ability to do anything whatsoever. It's the statement, it's a way of saying that Satan is limited in his ability to deceive. I'm not sure that got to the, did that not quite get it? Right, because you're reading it like an epistle. And you're reading it without the other 19 chapters in front of it, where we get example after example after example of what Satan is allowed to do in deception of the nations, but it's a deception that can only go so far because it's limited by God. So, yeah, if you jumped in, if this was the first thing you read, you might say that, but we have 19 chapters uh, where we see that this has been limited but not abrogated completely. He doesn't promise until the very final second coming for it all to be ceased completely. So you're saying since the cross, Satan has been Yes. Before then, things were worse than they are? Than they were at the cross, yes. He completely deceived Israel. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Hmm? Well, uh, did you hear the question? The question is, you know, you know, were Israel believers? And the answer is yes and no. The entire covenant community were not believers. In other words, the only people that were believers were who? The remnant. Right? God only promised to save a remnant out of Israel because they failed in their task to fulfill the, the covenant. So uh, all that remnant theology, in fact, that's what you know, Isaiah is often uh, um, credited for all of his remnant theology. But who is a believer in Israel are only the remnant who God has saved out of Israel, not geopolitical Israel as such. Yes? Okay. Which is not in this passage. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. I've often pondered the, uh, how much of Satan is in mankind, or how much not in, per se, but his yeah. influence, or is it, and what the ability of mankind is to be able to do the atrocities that we see yeah. even take place right now. It, uh, it seems that maybe without Satan's help that we have all the ability to do that within ourselves, in our fallen nature. And that's... Um, not necessarily needing Satan to take, take us back to before the cross. And there was certainly a lot of atrocities that took place in the Old Testament. Cutting off heads and putting them on, you know, walls and things like that. So it, it seemed like maybe a little extra uh, <laughs> deception, if you will, on, on how government should be run. Yeah. The picture in Revelation is binary. In other words, if, if you are an unbeliever, you are in the kingdom of darkness, which is ruled by Satan. There's no middle ground. Uh, so when, if you say you know, that we have the ability to be evil without Satan, I understand what you're saying. Right. The, the sin nature has enough impetus of its own to, you know, to run rampant with sin and evil. But uh, the sin nature, with, without the seal of Christ, um, is controlled by Satan. Uh, and that's the harsh reality. Sin nature. Sinners are controlled by Satan. 
If you are not sealed in Christ, the, the picture in Revelation is, you, you know, if you have the seal of Christ, that those who have this, the mark of the beast, the seal of the beast, are controlled by Satan, whether or not they admit it, know it, understand it, or, you know, agree with it even, right? But that they are controlled by that. And, and those who are sealed in Christ, that is the limiting of deception. There's, you, you, you will not deceive because you have the spirit of what? Truth. So the opposite of deception is truth. So the picture here is that uh, Christ limits Satan's ability to deceive believers because we have the spirit of truth. We're sealed in, 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 in Christ that way. Uh, so uh, I want to completely agree that there's plenty of, there's plenty of sin to go around. Uh, but at the same time, I want, I want people to understand that if you are not sealed in Christ, uh, remember what Jesus said, and it was, it's a harsh word. We, we can't hardly believe that Jesus is saying this when I quote it but you are of your father, the devil. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it, it is that binary. You know, it is that binary. Right, right, yeah. Um, and so the, um, the, the extent of the fall without Christ is kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. We have the ability to do pretty much anything Satan can do in a human nature. Yeah, it's a bottomless pit of evil. It, it can go anywhere. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Completely. Sadly, we see a lot of it every day on the, on the news. Um, verse 4, And then I saw thrones. Remember that? We had thrones. This is from Revelation 4 and 5. And they sat on them, and the judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and then came to life and reigned with Christ for these thousand years. So uh, the picture here is of those who, are, uh, who die in the Lord are resurrected to reign with Christ now. Do you remember what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6? He's chastising them for lawsuits. And uh, he said, you know, why would you go outside of the church to settle this? And why would you bother with that? And, and, and then he sticks this little one-liner in. I think it's in verse 2. He says, don't you know you're going to judge the world? And, and that's what a lot of Christians don't understand, that our, our destiny is to literally to rule and reign with Christ. Uh, and so you're saying, well, uh, uh, you see this in Hebrews. You know, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, you know, where are Christians right now? They are ruling and reigning with Christ right now. It's like, well, in what capacity do they rule and reign? Uh, and the answer is, I don't know. But I think it's mostly by agreeing with him <laughs> and worshiping him and, uh, you know, saying, you know, in effect, boy, you are right, you are right again. <laughs> there you go, you're right again. So, you, you, you know... You receive the res a resurrection at your death uh, to, to be with Christ, to be absent from the body. You're absent from the body, so it's disembodied, is to be present with the Lord. And the picture is, until Christ returns, what happens at Christ's return? We are given our glorified bodies, right? So until then, we're with Christ in a disembodied uh, state. Our souls are with Christ. Ruling and reigning, and this is the picture you see here, those who all who had died and they had been martyred, uh, and those who had died who had not worshipped the beast. In other words, the only way you're going to reign rule with, with Christ is by not worshipping the beast. You either worship Christ or you worship the beast. Uh, and they reigned with him for a thousand years uh, until uh, his return. All right? So, uh, now let me, if I can kind of give you what all the views are. All right, let's see if I can do this simply. So, if you are our mill, we take the thousand year as a symbolic representation of all the time between Christ's life, death, and resurrection and the second coming, however long that will be. Okay? That's that's the position, that's my, that is my personal position as I'm reading the scriptures. All right? 
uh, the, the position that you probably most know is called uh, pre-mill. And the pre-mill position means exactly that, that, that Christ returns and then the thousand years follows the return of Christ. So Christ returns in order to set up an earthly uh, kingdom, literally in Jerusalem, for a thousand years, and that thousand years is 365,000 24-hour days. Okay. I just did the math. <laughs> 365,000 24-hour days. All right. So that's the pre-mill position. All right. So uh, Christ returns, and there's a little... You say, well, where's the rapture and all that? Because that's what you've heard of, right? Yeah. All right. So the rapture is seven years prior to the second coming, if, you, if you're buying this system, which makes this uh, um, actually the third coming. Right? So it's kind of a misnomer there. But what happens, uh, the, the point uh, that those who subscribe to this will say is that prior to the second coming, which begins the millennial reign of Christ, seven years prior to that, there is a secret extraction of the church. So Jesus comes, but he doesn't land on earth, uh, and he extracts all of those who are in Christ. And then there's all hell breaks loose for seven years. Uh, you know, I could, it would take me an hour to explain all that, but this is when the Antichrist comes and he sets up a covenant with Israel. He breaks the covenant with Israel. And, you know, it gets pretty complicated. Uh, but then at the conclusion of that seven years, Christ comes now, in my counting, a third time and sets up a millennial reign on earth in Jerusalem. And he comes back uh, with the people of God to do that. Why do I think that's implausible? Because you have mixing on earth people who have gone on to be with the Lord and have glorified bodies with regular physical bodies, number one. Does that make sense to you? Why? They came back from heaven, they have glorified bodies, now they're mixing with people on earth for a thousand years. I'm just telling you that's their position. I'm not teaching it, I'm telling you that's what their position is. So, not only do they have, not only are they running around all mixed up, you know, some with glorified bodies, some with not glorified bodies. Now, guess what also that means? That while Christ is ruling and reigning on earth, people are sinning and dying. I mean, it's a real thousand years, right? People having babies, doing this, that, and the other thing. And so you have these two categories of people. But the Bible says that the fi in 1 Corinthians 15, that the final foe is what? Death. When Christ returns, there is no more death. But if you're a premillennial, you say, yes, there's all kinds of death going on in this thousand year period. And Jesus substantially makes things better, but not quite. All right? So that's pre-mill in a nutshell. Then there is post-mill. You guys are going to be dropping all these words around church on Sunday? Yeah, it was post-mill on you. All right, post mill means that the second coming happens here at the end of this thousand year period, post. Uh, and what post mill uh, will say is that there is going to be a substantial, and again, there's a lot of versions of this, but there's going to be a substantial revival. Uh, or, and maybe both, 
there's going to be a substantial Christianizing of all culture so that governments will be Christian, leaders will be Christian, uh, and, and they will substantially uh, Christianize the world and then Christ will return. All right, and again, there's a lot of variations on all these, but those are the three basic views. Any questions about the three basic views? Yes. yes. When does post mill start? When does the millennium start with post mill? Well, that's tough to find out. <laughs> Go ahead, Jennifer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's difficult because the thousand years in post-millennial thought is also a symbolic number. Okay. Uh, you know, they're not going to point to a calendar date and say, okay, the millennium started here. But the re you'll almost know it when you see it. Right? Uh, because there will be such a substantial revival and Christianizing of, of the entire world. Uh, that you will realize at some point you are in this long period of time, which they don't try to... Shoot, we, start, we forgot to start counting. Well, <laughs> you, it hasn't started yet. They know that. <laughs> no, they're pretty sure that it hasn't. Yeah, I mean, look at the world. Now, the problem I, what, what problem do I have with Post Mill? Because as I'm reading Revelation, suffering goes on right up until the end, right? People are suffering and martyrs and things like that. And so I can't quite get to post-mill. I mean, I am very optimistic about the work of Christ. I, you know, he will be victorious. Uh, people will come to him. Uh, I do think there will be probably a great revival at some point. I don't think we've seen the last of what Christ is going to do. But I can't quite get to post-mill because as I'm reading Revelation and as I read the rest of the New Testament, there's so much... Uh, Emphasis placed on the uh, on suffering as a regular portion of the Christian life until Christ returns, and when Christ returns, that's when there are no more tears and no more suffering and no more crying over there. What a day that will be! You know, my Jesus, I shall see. So, uh, uh, but until that point, in this world, you shall have tribulation. So I can't get to post mill. I, I can't quite get there. Uh, but I, I'm, I root for them because I really want the revival that they're talking about. And I would love the substantial Christianization of the world. <laughs> Believe me, I would think that would be great. Uh, but I just, I just can't quite get there. Uh, and I can't get to pre-mill for the same reason because you have a literal mixing for a thousand years of two races. You have the glorified uh, bodies of people who have already gone to be with the Lord and now returned with him, uh, and you have that mixed with sinful bodies and people who are still uh, not living for Christ, even though pre-mill will say that Christ substantially uh, wins during that period of time. It's a golden thousand years. There's not very much sin. But people do die, and, but they, don't, they take longer to die. A, a good pre-mill person will tell you that, you know, because Jesus is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, maybe the average lifespan is 150 years. I don't care. It doesn't get you, death is death is death, right? Just because you postpone it 50 years, I mean, it doesn't get you out of death. Death is death is death. So you had Jesus come back, and apparently his second coming did not conquer the final foe of death. Uh, that bothers me, all right? And then the second thing that bothers me about the pre-mill is that uh, pre-mill, I think, reads the Bible backwards. In other words, instead of the New Testament being the fulfillment of the Old Testament, so in the Old Testament we see shadows of things to come and the fullness is in Christ, instead it reads it in reverse. And so in this millennial reign, uh, they will tell you that as Jesus rules in Jerusalem, he restores the Levitical priesthood and restores and rebuilds the temple and reinstitutes animal sacrifices. To me, that's a, I, I can't get by it. Is that pre-trib? That, pre-trib is a different thing. <laughs> I, I, 
and, and this is, I, I want to make sure that for the sake of the camera, because I, I like the point uh, that Mary made. Mary said, I have never heard that before. That's the millennium, though. That is the millennium. No, no. Yeah. So Mary's point is that what I just described, she hadn't heard it, and that's exactly what I said at the beginning of the class. There's there are so many little pieces and words and that most people don't understand that this is a system. It's a hermeneutic, and. Uh, and these are the 15 essential steps for premillennialism in the books. If you want to read the textbook, you can read Dwight Pentecost, Things to Come. That is the definitive textbook on premillennial uh, eschatology. Uh, and these 15 points all have to occur. And I bet if I read them to you, even though you, know, you might have heard some of the things and not others, I, I think just like Mary, you'd like, oh man, I didn't know number nine was in there. <laughs> because, and I understand that. That's precisely what I'm talking about. Because these are full systems of thought. Uh, so what happens, Mary, uh, officially is when there's a rapture, seven years later, Christ, that is when he returns. And he returns to establish his physical rule on earth for a thousand years. Uh, uh, years, 365,000, 24 hour days, because that to them is a literal number. Uh, and, and it is then that the temple is rebuilt, the Levitical priesthood is restored, and sacrifices are, uh, commence once again, which is why I can't be pre mill. I, I just can't. Um, because I can't, I can't have Christ on the cross and go back to animal sacrifices. Just, I just can't do it. It's just a bridge too far. The picture becomes reality. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's just the reverse of the way the scriptures represent it. Um, so that is a, that's the official pre-mill thought. Okay? And probably you have all heard pieces of this, this and that, maybe not put it all together, not sure where it all fits. But these are systems and they're theological constructs uh, that are very uh, shaped, thought out. Uh, if, if someone was sitting here tonight who was pre-mill, uh, they would give you a very persuasive uh, argument from Scripture. They would. Any questions about that? No? Yes, go ahead, David. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, that, that's a good point. Uh, David, for the camera, said, uh, you know, a lot of this comes uh, from Daniel. A lot of these eschatological systems are, are not completely, obviously, cannot be completely built from six verses in Revelation 20. So once you decide on those six verses, you also have to decide how you're going to read prophecy in general. And Daniel is a very uh, uh, central prophet to all eschatology. Uh, and uh, in Ezekiel and Zechariah. So you have to, you're making a, do you know what I mean by a hermeneutical decision? You're making a decision about the overall interpretation of scripture as a whole. So I'll give you an example. Uh, why, what distinguishes uh, covenant theology from dispensational premillennialism? What is the central piece that, that it all pivots on? It all pivots on Israel. What is Israel? 
Did God make an independent plan and promise to geopolitical Israel? Or is Israel the shadow of things to come, which is the Church of Jesus Christ? That's the whole, the whole question hinges on that. And if you decide that God made a separate plan of salvation and a separate promise to geopolitical Israel, you will read the entire New Testament different than someone who disagrees with that. And all the things that David talks about, Daniel will look different to you now, uh, Isaiah looks different, Zechariah looks different, it's because these prophecies, uh, instead of being prophecies about the people of God and the new heavens and the new earth, now become prophecies that are applied to geopolitical Israel. But you didn't make that decision by reading the prophecy. You made that decision a priori by deciding that God made a separate promise to Israel than to his church, and that the church is a parenthesis in time. That God failed a little bit with Israel, and so the church is uh, plan B, and then he's going to circle back and pick up Israel after the church age is gone, and that is the millennium. So, the, you know, these decisions are not made by actually reading a, an individual passage of Scripture. They're, they're made on a, on, a, on a grand scale, a macroeconomic scale, if I can put it that way. And once you decide that geopolitical Israel has a unique place in the plan of God, then you are hermeneutically forced to read all the prophecies of the Old Testament in a very different way than I read them. But you made that decision before you read that prophecy. Before you interpreted it. Yes. <laughs> I'm using that synonymously, yeah. but yes. I think it also uh, really de-emphasizes the first coming of Christ. Yes. It bypasses it and looks further on yes. beyond at another time. Yeah. Another, another group of people. And, yeah. And that's pretty close to blasphemy right there. <laughs> All right. For the sake of the camera, what Paul is saying is, what happens is, and, and he's right, theologically, what happens is, it, if the real game is going to be played in the millennium with geopolitical Israel, then what that does is it minimizes Christ's initial coming. Because the real game doesn't play, get played until the second coming. And that, 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 I think, seriously devalues the cross of Christ. Uh, and... And of course, the cross of Christ is, is not particularly how geopolitical Israel gets saved, is it? That's why you got to start the sacrifices over. That's why you got to rebuild the temple. That's why you got to do all this stuff, right? So uh, when, God, when, when the scriptures say that all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ, do you know what yea and amen means? It means that everything that God promised was completely fulfilled and finished in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no more fulfillment left. Which means there's no more fulfillment for geopolitical Israel either. That the Israel of God, the reason that Paul ends Galatians by calling the church of Jesus Christ the Israel of God, is because the church of Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Israel. Uh, this is why Paul says in Galatians what? You are... If you have accepted Christ, you are of your father who? Abraham. So uh, everything that happens, you know, you've heard me say, in the Old Testament, concealed, right? It starts in the Old Testament, concealed. In the New Testament, revealed. Everything in the Old Testament is a shadow and a type and a small picture, but it's always pointing to the bigger picture who ends up being the fulfillment found in Christ. And so that's why Jesus says on the road to Emmaus, uh, and he rebukes him, didn't you know the law of the prophets and the writings, the law of the prophets and the writings, didn't you know that they're about me? Everything in the Old Testament is pointing to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not to geopolitical Israel. And if you read the Old Testament as if there are two plans of God, uh, you're going to bifurcate the Word of God. Uh, and, and it, it, you know, it's like God speaking out of, you know, both sides of his mouth. And 
I, you know, I just can't, I, I just can't quite get there. All right, so, verse 7. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. All right, so here's good news, finally. This is a point that all three positions agree on. If you're pre-mill, if you're on-mill, if you're post-mill, everybody agrees on this. And, I, and I'll, I'll just read it. And we'll come out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, that's from Ezekiel 38 and 39, to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. So uh, the picture is that Satan is released from his limitations to deceive. And he is now uh, running loose uh, with a uh, full opportunity to deceive all the nations which are from the four corners of the earth, from everywhere, and like the sands of the sea, so this, they're huge, and they came up upon the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. Uh, and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also and they will be tormented there uh, day and night forever and ever. So that's the end. That's the final end. So the picture is this. That it doesn't matter what, if you're post-mill, pre-mill or on-mill. Everybody agrees that uh, just prior uh, to the second coming, and again, this would be the third coming if you're pre-mill, but it, just prior to the final judgment, if I can put it that way, the second coming, the Lord is going to allow Satan some extra room to maneuver so that then his defeat will be public and permanent because when he's thrown into the lake of fire. Everybody agrees that just prior to the uh, what we are calling the second coming, Satan is going to have an increased, intense um, attack on the church of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, and and this, is, this is what Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians, a man of lawlessness. Uh, and, and, and he will be finally judged and thrown into the lake of fire. So this is another description of like the end of 19, where it talks yeah. about the final battle and yes. the end of the bowl. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and we've seen it with the, the bowls, we've seen it with the seals. So if you read Revelation like this, you know, it starts here, then it goes here and here and here and here and here, and you know, we've got 19, you know, and then we got 20, you're going to end up uh, re, you know, Revelation isn't written that way. Revelation is written this way. It keeps circling back on the same information. So we see the, we, you, know, you know, we see at the final bowls and the final seals, all of them recapitulate and describe the second coming. And it, it's like doing it from different camera angles. We're going to do it from the trumpets, and then we're going to do it from the bowls. Now we're going to do it from the seals. And then we get a big picture in, in 19. And now we, he's going to put the final stamp on it here in 20. But we've seen this over and over and over again. It, it does, it, it, it's not a chrono, chronological sequenced uh, vision. It's visions over and over again going over the same material and always leading up to the final judgment. So it reads, Revelation reads like this, not like this. It recapitulates and brings back over and over again. All right? That was, thank you. All right? Yes, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I, do, you, do you remember early in Revelation? I, I, the question was, uh, you know, obviously this is symbolic, um, um, but you remember in, uh, uh, I'm going to forget the chapter, but earlier it it described hell as a perpetual restlessness. Do you remember that? So what we know about the lake of fire, which is a symbol, you know, obviously, you know, a spirit being isn't going to get burned up, right? But what we know is that 
fire always stands for judgment and it's always separation from God. Uh, and so this will be a permanent and perpetual ongoing separation from God, which uh, will be torturous and awful. But uh, other than that, I don't think we get much more of a picture of it than that. Um, but I don't think it's real fire, if that's what you mean. Yeah. Uh, verse 11, uh, then I saw a great white throne, and this is, you've heard people talk about the great white throne judgment. Uh, in premillennial thought, there's several judgments, and the great white throne judgment is actually a distinguishable and different judgment from other judgments. Uh, 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 and again, I don't know if I can even, because my print's so small. Um, the great white throne judgment is where uh, every unbeliever uh, appears, but there has uh, been a judgment of the, of the uh, goats and the sheets prior to that. Uh, and th then there's also been the Old Testament uh, uh, judgments as well. But all the great white throne judgment, this is the final judgment. In, in, as I read Revelation, uh, the living and the dead are brought before the Lord and judged all at the same time. Uh, and those uh, who are not sealed in Christ into utter, uh, utter darkness, and those who are with Christ uh, uh, will be ushered into the new heavens and the new earth. White just stands for purity. So this is the great white throne, and him who sat upon it, which is Christ, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. Why, does earth, why do they flee away? Because they're not going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. And no place is found for them because they're not going to be with the people of God. And I saw the dead, the great, the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and this is the second death, the lake of fire, which is the final uh, judgment. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown uh, into the lake of fire. So, uh, th you know, this is not much different than what you see in first, you know, first Corinthians 15. Uh, first Corinthians 15, uh, 20, uh, six, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. That's the, so this is a picture of the, uh, the final judgment. So I, I, I don't see several judgments. It's just one single judgment. And then from that point forward, you're either ushered into the new heavens or the new earth, or you're ushered into the lake of fire. That, and that's the picture. And then uh, chapter 21 and 22, we're going to see the new heavens and the new earth and see what that looks like. Any, any questions about this so far? Yes, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, is one of the judgments that judgment will we all get crowns and things like that? <laughs> Paul wants a crown. <laughs> uh, we have a tiara for you, a little tiara. <laughs> You're going to love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, that, I mean, that's symbolic for we rule and reign with Christ, right? So we're co-regents if I can put it that way. So the crown is a symbol of that rule. Uh, yeah, this is it. <laughs> uh, anything else? Any other questions? Yeah? All right. So, again, pre-mill, post-mill, ah-mill. Choose your poison. Uh, let's not get into any, you know, fights about that. I'm ah-mill. You know where I'm coming from. Uh, that's how I preach it. That's how I see it. But I want you to know that uh, if this is not, if I haven't convinced you, uh, then this is, this is not a speed bump in our relationship. <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> not from my point of view. Just give me more time, though. I'll try to convince you. <laughs> give me more time. Uh, all right. Anything else? All right. Let's pray and we'll go. Lord, we thank you again for the chance to study your word. We realize this is the, maybe one of the most controversial passages in Scripture, so we want to, be, uh, to hold it loosely. 
Uh, we want to be faithful to your word. We do want to understand what it is that you have to say, uh, but we don't want to be uh, cavalier and judgmental either uh, with uh, others who might disagree with us. So for all the people of God tonight, I pray for unity among us and that uh, in these difficult portions of scripture, we may come to uh, be patient with one another uh, as we continue to study your word. I pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen.